The book is the book of Exodus, second book of the Hebrew Scriptures. It is called in Hebrew, in fact, Ve'ele Shemot, or just shortened to Shemot. These are the names. The other day, some of you asked me uh, the date to put on the front flap of the book. And I think it's a fair question. So in order to get the date of Exodus, I want you to turn to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. That sounds funny. I want to give you the date of Exodus, so let's go to much, much later and go to 1 Kings. And 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 says it came about in the 480th year after the sons of Israel came out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month of Ziv, which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. Now, that's an important statement because we know something about the dates of Solomon. Through an entirely uh, different system of proofs, we know something about the dating of this temple. And what I'd like you to see is the fourth year of Solomon's career is either dated at 966, 960, or 957. We have a problem with some of the dates, but we get down to about 960. So I'm going to use that 960 date. And I'm going to use that as my foundational date, and I'm going to build off that date. And by the way, we have quite a bit. The fourth year of his reign is probably literally right down to 966. That's the year I think is, is the date in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. I think that Solomon's reign started in 971 and went to 931, and the fourth year is 966. And I think if you pinpoint 966, and you add that David... On top of that, reigned 44 years. From the start of David's ministry, then, you go to 1010. I'm going backwards on the timeline. If you go to the start of Saul's reign, which was 40 more years, you're now at 1050. We also know that there was about 300 years in the land from the time of the judge Jephthah in Judges chapter 11, verse 26. Somewhere on your opening flap, of Exodus, you're going to need a couple of verses. You're going to want to know 1 Kings 6, 1. Then you're going to want to go backwards to Judges 11:26, 26. And you're going to find out that Jephthah got there when they had been in Canaan. And Jephthah, uh, Jephthah arrived in 11:26 in Judges when they had been in Canaan for 300 years. That means that it pushes Joshua's conquest back to about 1400 B.C. Now, Moses lived in the land of Midian for 40 years. And we know that in Exodus 2 and in Acts chapter 7, there was a 40-year time span when he was in Midian. Follow me for just a second, because I'm going to actually turn this into something. So 966 plus 44 for David, plus another 40 for Saul, plus another 40 years from the time of Saul to Jephthah's statement, which was given in about 1090, plus another 300 years, and now we're at 1390. Everybody follow where I'm going? And then you get to 1390, and Joshua led the people for 16 years. Now I'm at 1406. And there were 40 years wilderness wanderings, and I'm at 1446. So the start of the Exodus is dated to 1446. Is it a fixed date? Yes, give or take a little bit. One of the problems we have is that um, Israel, Israelites had a 360-day year. We have a 365-day year. They had a, an Adar Shani, a 13th month that they threw in every now and then. You think we have a leap year? They had a leap year by adding a whole month. But it meant that they corrected seasons periodically, and they weren't always, shall I say, religious about doing it. And so it messes up our calendar. Now, the important thing is this, Mount Sinai then, as a date, 1446. I can tell you that it was uh, coming up on the summer of 1446. I, I know the time of year. And I also know that that tells me when Moses was born. Because you might remember from our previous studies, how old was Moses when the initiation of the Exodus occurred? 80, and his brother was 83. So they had, you know, walker races and whatnot. I'm kidding, no, I'm sorry. That's, now, the 80-year-olds out there are mad at me now. But now here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that you might think, well, gee, Randy, that's, that's not so old. You try leading a group of people through a desert. Try getting on a camel. 
it's perilous to your health to get on a camel at 83. And here's the, here's the reality. If you add 80 years to 1446, you're going to get 1526, and that's when Moses was born. As best I can tell you, in 1526, Moses was born. Now, when we're talking about the book of Exodus, we're really talking about a book that comes in three parts. Step number one is Exodus 1 to 19. Let's just summarize Exodus 1 to 19 as preparation of Moses all the way through the journey until they arrive at the law, the mountain of the law, not the, the law, at the mountain of the law. So Exodus 1 to 19, from the background of there came about a Pharaoh who knew not Moses, the call of Moses all the way until they're standing at the mountain of the law. Exodus 20, 21, 22, 23 are the laws of, that God gives to Moses up on the mountain. He comes down with those laws. And in 24, there's a covenant for those laws. They all say, yes, we will do this. And they pledge allegiance to the law. Of course, they don't manage to get a month before they've absolutely trashed that. But the point is that they made the commitment. So in chapter 21, 2, 3, it is the uh, 20, 21, 22, 23, it is the law. 24, you have the commitment of the covenant. From 25 to 40, you have more or less the story of the weaving of the people through the tabernacle. It's not only about the tabernacle, but when you grossly look at it in three chunks, you can say the bulk of it will be about how to make the tabernacle or God's building program. When Moses went up on the mountain, he came down with two things, not one. He came down with the law and he came down with a building program. And the next thing they did is what you always do when you have a building program, they took up an offering. And they got all kinds of stuff until they finally had to say, enough, we got more than we can use. And God used Bezalel and those whom he empowered miraculously to build the tabernacle. So we've got journey, 1 to 19. 20 to 24 will be law and covenant. 25 to 40 will be tabernacle. Now let's unpack that a little bit. In the 1 to 19 section, we looked at it in class, and so we want to spend a little bit of time there. Let's just say that the first four chapters are really God preparing Moses, and 5 through 7 are Moses versus Pharaoh. Ding! It's a series of rounds, one round after another, Moses versus Pharaoh. Go back to the beginning, and when you open up chapter 1, there's a question behind the book. The question behind chapter 1, as it says that there came about a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph in verse 8, the, is this. Does God have the right to navigate my life into trouble? Because here are his people, and he has navigated them into a situation that is trouble. We pointed out when we looked in chapter 1 that if you look very carefully, the issue of chapter 1 is very clear. They got there because Jacob was brought into the land. They got there because Joseph was in the land protecting them. They got there because of a famine. They got there because Joe had this incredible attitude that says, you may have sold me into slavery, but God had a purpose. He was saving the nation. Bring on daddy and bring everybody with you and come on. Well, that's fine. But they stayed. And their flocks and their herds grew. And the famine was long since over and they didn't move. In other words, in chapter 1, the lesson is when I overstay my purpose, I get comfortable doing what God didn't call me to do because I'm comfortable. There was a land of promise. They didn't go back to it. Why? Because they were doing so well. Why should they go back? But that's not their land. So what did God do? He brought about trouble to bring about obedience. I would remind you that in the book of Acts, when this happens again to the church, God brought about persecution to force the church out to obey. You're going to be witnesses to me in the other most parts of the world, but nobody left. And so he brought persecution, and then they suddenly left, and then they were obedient. The pattern of the two books is very similar. May I suggest to you that in chapter 2, you find that um, Moses is God's answer to the people being in Egypt. But Moses starts off as a major failure. The lesson of the first half of chapter 2 is very simple. God wants to do God's will God's way. Moses wants to do Moses' will Moses' way. And so what God does is he allows Moses to pass through a circumstance in which Moses tries his best to make something happen and blows it. 
You remember the story. He sees someone beating, an, uh, an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and so he kills the Egyptian, having looked both ways in premeditated murder, having buried the guy in the sand, and the bottom line is he thought he was going to get away with it, but guess what? That's not at all what was happening. So I want you to see that you start off chapter 2 with the, the call of the um, birth and the early life of Moses, but you move very quickly into how Moses does God's will, set the people free, Moses' way. Now, by the time you get to the middle of the chapter, you find out that Moses is slumped at a well in the Midianite territory out in the Sinai Desert. And the important thing about it is that from the middle of chapter 2 all the way through 3 and into chapter 4, God is going to be preparing Moses. I think it's instructive to me that God spends two and a half chapters drawing out his preparation of Moses. Why would that be important? Well, it's interesting because in the New Testament, we have, we have four Gospels that draw out the discipleship process of how God built the leaders of the early church. But, but in the book of Exodus, we go from chapter 1 and Moses being born, and by, by chapter 7, he's standing in front of Pharaoh, let my people... So how did that happen? How did he go on this cosmic race to become God's representative? Here's what I think you'll find. I think you'll find that in chapter 2, verse 16, he's slumped by a well and he's exhausted and God uses his, his exhaustion because it's not until Moses settled down and was exhausted that God could begin to use him. I think what you'll find is that uh, a couple of gals came to the well and, and some men tried to shoo them away, but Moses had a chip on his shoulder for injustice and God was going to use that chip for the rest of his life. So he shooed away those other shepherds and he took care of those girls and ended up at Jethro's house. He had no idea what God was doing, but God was calling him into a tent of a man who already knew him. Jethro, the Midianite, still had, from the old days of Abraham, a walk with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The people of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph were long since in Egypt, but the faith still continued. And so when Moses ran back into the tent of a Midianite, he had no idea he was running right smack back into the hands of the Hebrew God. But God knew. It wasn't by happenstance he ended up slumped on that well that day. What's interesting to me is that by the beginning of chapter 3, you get to this burning bush. Moses is just doing what he's doing. He's spending his time. He's going to have 40 years to hang out in the Midianite desert. I have been in the Midianite desert many times. It's very beautiful if you like the color changes of the desert, but really, aside from watching cockroach races, races at night, there's really not a lot to do. It's not an exciting place. I mean, seriously. People sit around and talk about goats and sheep and how funny they did something today. I mean, I got to tell you, there's a reason Midianites never had Facebook, because they would just all have the same pictures. It would not be funny. Look at what my goat did. Oh, yeah, well, look at what my goat did. That runs out after a few goat pictures. So what I find in chapter 3 is this. God calls him at a burning bush. And he comes up, and the very first thing that happens is God is introducing himself to Moses. Moses doesn't know the name of his own God, and his people don't know the name of, his, uh, of their own God. It has been so long. It's funny because Moses is getting schooled of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He got it under his mama and her tutelage, and then he got it in the Midianite camp under Jethro. So he's got bits and pieces of the story, but he's not met God. God calls to him. He says, get your sandals off, I'm holy. And the beginning place of his call was to know the distinctiveness of God because he would never be usable by God unless he understood that God is not like him. He can't be manipulated. He can't be pushed around. When you're the God of the universe, you don't sweat the small stuff because you got it all in your hands. And he says, I want you to do something. I want to tell you a story in verses uh, 7, 8, 9. He says, I, I want to tell you a story. The story is about a people that's in Egypt that are struggling and they're under bondage. And I feel really badly about this. And I have remembered my covenant toward them. And you're going, hey, man. And Moses is going, hey, man. Yes, set the people free. And then it all turns in verse 10 when he says, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go for me. It was going so well. 
It was going so well until he said, I want you to do it. He says, who am I, verse 11 of chapter 3, that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he's asking the wrong question. The question isn't who you are when God calls you. The question is who God is who called you. And so he made it very clear in this crystal clear legal definition. What did he say? God said to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. Does everybody have it now? It's absolutely clear. I am who I am. Actually, that is clear. God said, I'm the ever-present one. That's what he said. You remember me as the God of your fathers, and I was, but I am. Don't pin backwards what I used to be. Walk with me. You'll find out what I am. God, the ever-present one. Now, what's interesting is that <laughs> Moses kept arguing with him. And you go all the way through chapter 4, and you find that there's a, a long-term argument going on. And when I get to the beginning of chapter 4, uh, the Lord says to him, what's in your hand? He says, a, a staff, a stick. Throw it on the ground. So he did. Now, that part was easy. But in chapter 4, he says, now go and grab the tail of the serpent that I just turned the stick into. Now, if you know anything about serpents, you know this. Never grab them by the tail. So now Moses has to do what's counterintuitive. He's got to do the opposite of what his training in Midian, which was, if you're going to get a snake, get him at the head, never at the tail. He'll turn around and bite you. Now, here he is dealing with a God who can take a dead stick and turn it into a living snake, and he does it. He grabs it by the tail, and it becomes a staff in his hand. He says, listen, I'm giving this to you so that when you get into the land, if you run into trouble, throw the stick down. It'll really get everybody going, ooh, a stick that turns into a snake. But the problem is that Moses isn't happy with that. So he steps back toward the middle of chapter 4 and says, b -b -b B -b -b but I d d d don't speak well. And so God says, well, okay, um, first of all, I happen to know all about your mouth. I can tell you on a molecular level how your mouth is created. You don't really know much about mouths. By the way, you have a problem with the second molar on that side and you need to floss more. But the point is that he says, I just want you to understand, I know all about your mouth. Who made man's mouth? The anger of the Lord, in verse 14, burned against Moses. So he said, all right, okay, all right. You don't want to do the speaking? I will turn this over to somebody next to you. You got a brother. He's named Aaron, right? Well, yeah. I'll tell you what. He's a good speaker. I'll put him in your life, and he'll speak for me for you. I wanted you to do it, but you don't want to do it, so I'll bring up somebody else. You'll see this again in David and Saul. He'll just put it on someone else. And so he says, listen, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to give you Aaron, which sounds great. Good. Now I've got a partner. Now we're a team of ministry. Aaron will become one of the bigger pains in his life. And Aaron was never supposed to be in the room. He was there because Moses wouldn't do the job. Mo, you don't want it? I'll give you a friend slash enemy. So one of the things we noted in chapter 4 was in verse 18 and following, before he went and, and took on Pharaoh, before he did what God said, he went back to the man he, that was in charge of the flock. He went back to Jethro. He said, uh, Jethro, I need your permission. I, I, I want to do this thing which the Lord has told me to do, but I'm not going to drop these flocks in the middle of the wilderness and take off. I'm going to hand this over in an orderly way, and I'm asking your permission. Jethro had been good to Moses, but Jethro had God be good to him. And so Jethro was ready to move when God was ready for Moses to move. By the time you get to chapter 5, you start to get into um, the first pass. And I love the build-up to this. Do you remember what we did? We did a little kind of an anthem build-up. Uh, remember what happens at the end of chapter 4? He comes out and he, he meets Aaron, and now he's got his teammate, and things are really going good, so I want you to build your anthem music. And by the time you, you, he gets up in front of the uh, elders of Israel by 429, and he speaks, and Aaron speaks, and everybody's going, amen, yes, God is in this, and it's really exciting, and, and the people believed, and, and he's, he's flying high from the camp meeting. All right, here he is, Moses. 
and everybody's really excited. And he walks into Pharaoh and he says, uh, thus says the Lord, chapter five, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, yeah, no, not so much. Who is the Lord that I would obey his voice and let Israel go? Don't know who he is, don't really care. Glad you had a good time with your own folks there. Glad they really loved you at the rally, but I'm not part of your fan club and I'm not one of your fanboys. Can you hear the breaking glass? Twice before when God called him, he said, you're going to go. The people are going to follow you and Pharaoh's not going to listen. You're going to go. The people are going to follow you. Listen to me, Mo. Pharaoh's not going to listen. He went and the people followed him and Pharaoh didn't listen. And he came back and said, God, why did you do that to me? Because I told you that's how it was going to happen. But God didn't just tell him that's how it was going to happen. God explained to him why. You know, you get to 522. Why did you send me? Everybody's mad at me. The labor's been increased. Now they have to make bricks without straw. And everybody hates me now. And I don't know why you ever sent me. And, and God has over and over already said, you need to understand, I want to make Israel odious to the Egyptians so that they don't just let you leave. They throw you out. And by the way, take gold bricks and silk and wrap them around your heads and throw them at you as you're on your way out the door. I want to fill your wallet with good stuff as they're going, take whatever I have, just get out of my house. So I'm going to make this a little hard on you. But here's the thing. If you'll follow me, not only will the Egyptians let you go, but for the next several generations, while you're establishing yourself in the land, they won't have the cash to come chase you because you'll have their cash. And if you'll just do what I say, I'm working a long-term plan here, Mo. We get to chapter 6, and what we see is that the Lord said to Moses, you'll see what I will do for Pharaoh, for under compulsion he will let them go, and under compulsion he will drive them out of his land. So... Once again, Moses is put in the situation to come. He's told to tell Pharaoh that he wants to send the people away for three days into the wilderness to worship him. What's interesting to me is that the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them charge to the sons of, uh, of Israel and to Pharaoh to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And then the second half of the chapter tells you all of the people as they're beginning to be organized by households. Don't miss this. That's not some little, and so-and-so is the head of this household and he, this is his son. This is the beginning of organization of slaves into a nation. That's what's going on here. They haven't left Egypt and God is already putting the ranks of Israel together right there in the land of Goshen and Egypt. By the time I get to the end of chapter 6, it comes about that, that the Lord says, I want you to do this. And at the end of chapter 6, Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am unskilled in speech. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? Chapter 7 begins with God stepping into the throne room of Pharaoh with Moses to challenge Pharaoh face to face. So, Aaron spoke to Pharaoh in the beginning of chapter 7, verse 2. Pharaoh didn't listen. And as was predicted, Aaron whipped out the stick. Remember the stick? Threw it down. And then you see in the second part of chapter 7 that not only did he throw his stick down, but the magicians, who, by the way, are some of the most mind-numbingly stupid characters in all of the Bible, because every time a plague starts and there's all kinds of locusts and all kinds of flies, they're over there trying to make more. Instead of a potion that's going to actually kill it, they're showing that they can duplicate it, which has got to be one of the dumbest things you can do in the middle of a, an attack of locusts. Let's make some more locusts. Like, wow, that's dumb. So in the middle of chapter 7, it says that he throws down his stick. The magicians go, guess what? We can do that too. They throw down their sticks, and all the staffs are on the floor, and now all the staffs become snakes and... Aaron's staff eats the other staffs and they all go away staffless <laughs> because God isn't second to anybody. Well, Pharaoh didn't get the point because his heart was hardened. 
So we begin a series of things from 7, 14 to 19, the beginning of the 10 plagues. The very first plague was the blood Nile. The Nile was turned into blood, but so was the water sources and even those that were in pots. All of a sudden, everywhere they looked, the lifeline of Egypt is the Nile. You go two miles off the Nile and it's brown dust. There's nothing there. It hugs the Nile all the way from upper Egypt all the way down to lower Egypt as it goes out into the Mediterranean. Egypt is the Nile. If the Nile is smitten, Egypt is smitten. Their lifeblood, their, their market economy is frozen. Nobody wants to get into the middle of a blood river. And so their FedEx trucks come to a stop. Nothing's moving. I pointed out to you that each of these areas of Egypt, each of these were attacks on specific gods of Egypt. And so the god Hapi and the god Anket and the god Khenemu were gods of the Nile and of the water sources. And the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is stronger than Hapi and stronger than Anket and stronger than Khenemu. And he can turn it on and he can turn it off because he is the master of those three gods. By the time you get to chapter 8, verses 1 to 15, the goddess Het. She's a woman's body with a frog's head. She is representative of the comforts of Egypt. Egyptians loved frogs because the frogs were the only thing keeping the flies at bay. And I, can I tell you, if you were standing here in Egypt right now, what we'd all be doing is this, no matter what room you're in, in Egypt. Egypt is loaded with flies. I never picnic in Egypt, ever. And the truth is that the frogs come and they say, chapter eight says, even in their mixing bowls and their kneading bowls, popping out of the ovens as they're doing everything, there's a frog in every direction. And that's always been a symbol of their comfort. And, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is stronger than Hecht. And so the frogs were there, then the frogs were killed, then the frogs were piled up in bodies. And now we got stinky frogs. By chapter 8, verses 16 to 19, Cheper, who is the uh, god of the insects, is about to be attacked by the god of Abraham as the lice and the fleas and the chiggers. In 8, 16 to 19, I can't talk about them without starting to itch, come upon the land. And they went from the lifeline of Egypt to the comfort of Egypt, and now they're dealing with the personal comfort of Egypt, and everybody's scratching. And this is really getting on the nerves of people, but, but chapter 8, verses 20 to 32, now flies come out, and the scarab that is still a jewelry item sold all over the world, that little beetle scarab represents flies and represents beetles, flying insects. It's actually a piece of jewelry. You can go right here in Sebring to the mall, and you can buy a scarab. It still continues to be part of superstition, and that's what it represented. It was superstition. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was stronger than Scarab because he's stronger than your superstitions and he broke their back. By chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, it was livestock that were killed. But interestingly enough, the God Hop or the God Apis, the God of the livestock, this is your long-term market. This is your commodity market. God attacked it and he took it down because the God of Abraham is stronger than the God Hop or Apis. In chapter 9, verses 8 through 12, Imhotep, who is the god of he health and healing, the best universities and healthcare system in the world was in Egypt, but he got a whooping from the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who brought the boils and could shut them off. Why? Because the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was stronger. And then in 9, 13 to 35, you find that hail comes down. And Newt, the god of the sky, is breached by the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who can take his sky and turn on hail and turn it off. And Newt stands silent before the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all the Egyptians are learning that. And Pharaoh is learning that. But so is Moses, and so are the people of Israel learning that. You don't know my name? Let me show you what I do. Let me show you what I can whip up for a little hailstorm. And then in chapter 10, locusts came down in 1 through 20. And Seth, the god of the crops, 
was breached by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and right after that, a, a plague of darkness in 10, 21 to 29. This was a darkness you could feel. Remember I described for you that there's a soil in the Middle East called less soil, L-O-E-S-S, that'll blow high up into the altitude. And, and it still happens on certain occasions today. And when the less soil blows up into the atmosphere, it'll actually cause flights to deviate around the storm in the Middle East because all the way up to 35 5,000 feet, there's a dust storm that if they flew through, it would suck into their engines and take their engines out. When President Jimmy Carter tried to rescue the Iranian hostages, they took out our, our uh, helicopters because they sucked in less soil because it was a plague of darkness. It says it was a darkness you could feel. When this happens, the street lights go on in Jerusalem at 2 o'clock in the afternoon because it gets dark. And you saw another one of these when Jesus was on the cross. Another darkness, a plague of darkness that falls on the land. Well, Ra, the God of the sun, got blocked by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, you can turn on the sun, but I can shut it off. There's little you can do to defend yourself, Egypt, for I am the Lord and there is none else, he says. And then finally in chapter 11, verses 1 to 10, we come to the 10th and final plague. And this is the plague against the firstborn. The firstborn of every man, the firstborn of, of the servants, the firstborn of the households that were not marked with one special marking. God says in chapter 12, verses 1 to 5, I want you to take a lamb. I want you to, to, to kill the lamb. Then I want you to make it your lamb. And that's the pattern of redemption from chapter 12. That redemption comes from blood, but redemption comes from personal appropriation of blood. It has to be your lamb, not just a lamb. And then you paint it on the tent posts of your houses, and I will see that, and I will pass by. Don't go outside the house, or your firstborn will die. Stay inside the house, take the hyssop, and paint it up onto the tent post. You'll see that hyssop plant again. It's not only a paintbrush, it's also what vinegar mixed with gall was fed up to Jesus while he was on the cross. Because everything about the cross was represented by that Passover lamb. And so John will take the time to tell you details from the Passover that live in the imagery of Jesus. It's interesting because right after that, Pharaoh said, all right, you can go, take, take, Money, cash, prizes, go, just leave. Uh, I have lost so many. The cries of Egypt are everywhere. I don't want you here. And they loaded up the carts, lock, stock, and bagels, and off they went out to the wilderness. But interestingly enough, God led them. He gave them a pillar of fire, and he gave them a cloud. He gave them direction, and if you read carefully in chapter, uh, the end of chapter 12 through chapter 13, they went exactly where God told them to go, and they went the long way, not the short way. They, they could have been there in four days, back in the promised land, but God didn't take them that way because he knew that they would see a real army, and they had not yet formed an army. So God took them the long way. Why? Because the promised land wasn't ready for them, and they weren't ready for the promised land. And we made the note that sometimes God doesn't get you there the short way. He takes you the long way because even though you think you're ready, you're not ready. And even if you are ready, they're not ready. And so the missionary goes into a deputation and finds himself two and a half years going church to church to raise funds. And he's going, God, I don't get it. I've got a burden to be over there. And God says, you're not ready and they're not ready. I'll give you the right amount in your bank account. You'll know when you're ready. Just stay at the task. They found out that the long way home was the right way home. The problem with Pharaoh is he's fickle. And so immediately what you start to see is after he loses all these servants, he's not that happy about it anymore. So he starts to look and say, what can I do? How can I get my servants back? Pharaoh decided that he would, he would rise up and he would go after them. The problem is that God wasn't very helpful in this regard. Now, he organizes chariots, and they're following their pillar of cloud and fire by night, 
and they're doing what God told them to do. And by the time we get to chapter 14, they have gone the long way, but now they've been led by the pillar and the cloud right up to the water. Their back is to the sea. They can't turn and escape. And now Pharaoh decides to show up with his chariots and the people are going, what are we going to do against 600 chariots? How do we deal with tanks? Are you kidding? What are we going to do? Throw silk at them? And God says to Moses, tell the people to stand back and be quiet. Now, you're going to hear God give that instruction a lot to the children of Israel. Would you guys just be quiet? What he says is, I'm about to work. Stand back and see the work of the Lord. And he parks himself right between the Israel and the Egyptians. And Israel says, well, that's great, except for we can't go that way and the water's at our back. He says, Mo, grab the stick. Now, every time Moses gets the stick, God's going to do something cool. So Moses goes, okay, where's the stick? Get the stick. And he says, now, I want you to go like this, as only Charlton Heston and Moses could ever do. <laughs> and the water parts, and the people are standing there. And you get to, 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 to verse 13, in the middle of chapter 14, and, and the water uh, uh, comes apart, and the people go back, and they're starting to walk through the dry ground, and, and Moses stretches out in verse 21 his hand over the sea, and the Lord swept the sea back, and a strong east wind blew all night, and they walked across. You can see it from the movie. I mean, all the people are doing their thing, and they're trying to get the, the ox that's not wanting to go, and, 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 and of course, for effect in the movie, the cloud or pillar of fire gets a little weak every now and then, and the Egyptians start moving forward because they needed a little bit of license. It's Hollywood, after all. But in the original case, God allows the Egyptians to run in. Now, be careful. It doesn't say that Pharaoh went into the sea. If you read the Hebrew carefully, he took himself to the edge of the water. He sent the army into the sea. And so the army goes into the sea. So Pharaoh goes on, see. Here's the important thing. The Lord saved Israel that day. But I want you to go to the end of chapter 14 and look at what he told him to do. The Lord saved Israel that day, verse 30, from the hand of the Egyptians. The next thing Israel saw were dead Egyptians on the seashore. By that point, they pretty much knew there was no way to get back. Even if they could build boats and head back to Egypt, they weren't going to be welcomed there because there were dead Egyptians all over the uh, place. When Israel saw the power that God had used, they feared the Lord and they feared and believed in Moses. They got it. Somebody broke out in song. Miriam was doing a little singing. Moses was doing some dancing. They were all having a great time in chapter 15. And by the end of chapter 15, somebody looked at the canteens and realized that it was springtime. It was only going to get hotter and they didn't have any water. And so when you get down to 15, 23 to 26, God takes them to a place called Mara, where you can take one teaspoon of the water that is calcium and magnesium, and you put one teaspoon of that in your mouth and you swallow it. It won't kill you, but it'll give you the worst case of the runs you've ever had in your life. And they all go, what are we going to do? And God gives them a branch and says, throw it in there and it'll be okay. And then he says, listen, guys. I brought you here to drink the water. Next time I tell you to do it. But I don't want to have an upset stomach. Yeah, but you see, I'm not just trying to get you out of Egypt. I'm trying to get Egypt out of you. And if you'll do what I say, you'll have none of the diseases of the Egyptians. You've got parasites. You're carrying a whole colony of Egyptians in there with you, and I'm trying to get rid of them. So would you just do what I tell you to do? By the way, go right around that corner, and then there was 12 springs of water, wells of water at Elim. It's not that there wasn't water, it's that he took them by way of this because he wanted to give them diarrhea. Why? Because you serve a God who gives you what you need, not what you ask for. <laughs> and so they came and they went to Elim in verse 27. Chapter 16 tells the story of how they said, what are we going to do for bread? And God gave them something called manhu. It means, it is, what is it? Meaning, we have no idea what this is. We've never seen this before and God kept delivering it. But he made them get up and go out and get it and put it in baskets and bring it back because he knew when they got into the land and he shut off the manna, they were going to have to go out to the fields to work the fields. So they needed to get used to walking out, doing the gathering, bringing it back every single day. They needed to know what work was all about. 
When they wanted meat, chapter 16, verses 8 to 21, say that the quail were delivered as quail roasters right to them. But right after that, at the end of chapter 16, he said, look, here's how you do it. Six days, you go out, you get exactly what you need. On that sixth day, you get a double portion. Any other day you get a double portion and try to store it up, I'll make it rot right in your pot. It only works on the weekend. So that on Sabbath, you don't have to go out and collect anything. Because I want you to understand that's how it's going to work. And of course, you always have some knucklehead that goes, hey, I think I'll sneak out on Sabbath and see what happens. And here's what, here's what happened. They ended up dead. Because God says, look, you can think it's a slight thing to disobey me. It's really not. I need you to do what I tell you to do. They walked on a little bit further. Chapter 17, they couldn't find any water. Moses knew how to get water from the rocks. I know how to do it. People who work in the wilderness areas know how to do it. Those of you from Western Pennsylvania have seen this on the turnpike as you drive by. When metamorphic rock and sedimentary rock come together, the rains fall, go down through the sedimentary rock, hit the metamorphic rock, and come out to the surface. But when they do, they leave calcium deposits on the wall. The water's behind the calcium. If you know where the seam is by watching the geology, you can bang off the front of the rock, and the water will shoot out. The miracle wasn't that Moses knew how to get water from a rock. The miracle was that God was putting enough water behind that calcium deposit for the last 200 years so that they had enough for everybody's canteen. God already was working a plan here. And what's interesting is that at Rephidim they did it, and as soon as they did, they used up the water supply of Rephidim and the Amalekites came and attacked them. And God said, I want Moses to go up on a hillside, I want him to put up his hands, and I want him to pray. And when he stops interceding, they start losing. And by the way, I want you to park next to you some guy named Joshua, and I want him to see that. And I want Hur and Joshua to pick up the hands of Moses so that they can watch him agonize in prayer as the battle rages in the valley below. Because I want Josh to know that for the 16 years he's going to lead this people, he's going to need to be a guy who's not just good at military, but is good at intercession because that's where the battle's fought. And there it was, the Amalekites attacked but were routed. Just about that time in chapter 18, Jethro dropped by his father-in-law to say, the thing that you are doing is not good. You are really making a mess of things. You have people waiting for you for a number of hours, and you're making a judgment over everything. Here's the truth. You need to split this down, teach some people, make some disciples, and get them doing this. Write the laws, and there it is. In 18, there it is, God using Jethro's mouth to begin Moses' authorship career. Jethro says, start writing this stuff out because other people are going to need to be able to read it. Interestingly enough, when he gets up to the top of the mountain in just a couple of chapters, God's going to write it out for him the first time. Nothing like God using a little primer and giving it to you the first time already done. By the time you get to chapter 19, at the beginning of chapter 19, they are cordoning off the bottom of the mountain of the law. God made it very clear. He repeated the instruction to them over and over. See to it that no one touches the mountain. See to it that their goats don't touch the mountain, that no one comes near. I, I want to meet with you. I want to talk with you. I, I want to I tell you about what I've done so far. I want to tell you about what I'm going to do with you. But no one else is to be here. And the Lord visits him, and he's on Mount Sinai. And in chapter 19, verse 18, Sinai was filled with smoke, and fire descended upon it, the smoke of a furnace, and the whole vi a mountain quaked violently, and the people stood down in the valley and looked up there, and they knew God was running a pyrotechnic show at the top of the mountain. And he was making something very clear. This isn't Moses running up there trumping up some laws. This isn't a group of psychologists trying to figure out what, how we could tailor some laws for the people. God met man. And he began to give him the law of the civil code of how to get along for the next 38 years, 3 months, and 10 days on the camping trip. The civil code of law is found in chapters 20, 21, 22, and 23, but it's also found in the continuation of the journey in Numbers, in Numbers 5, 6, 15, and 28 to 30. And the purpose is to get you to see one thing about the law. Do you remember? 
that in the principal approach to the law, what makes GCBI's principal approach to the law different than what you learned before is this. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, here's how you deal with the law. You heard it said, you shall not kill. I say to you, killing can be with your mouth, not just a weapon. I say to you, it's your job to care for relationships. I say to you, it's more important if someone has ought against you that you drop your gift on the way to the altar and go take care of your brother. See, when I said thou shalt not kill, I meant this, but I only said this. The principal approach is, what's the principle behind the law? Because although the law was given in a specific situation to a specific group of people, the principle behind it is a God who does not change. So, God will never be for people slandering others. Because slander is a violation of the law of murder. You wouldn't know that if Jesus didn't make it clear, but he did. He said, lust isn't something with your hands, it's something with your heart. So I said this, don't commit adultery. But here's what I meant. I meant don't think it. Don't explore it in your mind. Don't explain to yourself reasons why it might be better and rationalize it. Don't think about it. Because when you do this, you did this. That's the principal approach to the law. And what's important is where we're dealing with people, they're coming up and they're going, well, we're not under law. No, but we're under principle. And God, who does not change, didn't used to be hateful about it and now likes it. He didn't go, I used to not like that, but now I'm really okay with it. That's not the God you serve. I am the Lord, I change not, he says. In 24, Moses comes back down off the mountain. And do you remember that the people have affirmed the covenant? Moses had gone up alone. And in chapter 24, he comes back down and he recounts the words of the Lord to the ordinances of the people. And then in verse 9, he went up with Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. And they had an interesting and wonderful time together. In chapter 24, the elders of the people had lunch with God. It's one of the weirdest stories in all of the Hebrew scriptures. God dropped by and they had a luncheon. And the whole purpose was so that those at the second half of chapter 24 would know Moses isn't making this stuff up. They need to know that God passed by. They were having lunch and God dropped by. There's a, a graphic description so that they saw God and they ate and drank in verse 11. How weird is that? But the whole point is this. Moses isn't up here by himself, and you elders of Israel are going to have to go down and defend this law, and so I want you to know Moses isn't making it up. I'm here. Unfortunately, the next section gives us just the tabernacle details, and, and we're going to come back and look at those tabernacle details. That's not the unfortunate part. I'm holding that, unfortunately, for just a minute. The chapter 25, 26, 27, 28, 29... 30, 31 are specifics of the pattern of worship that God established in the tabernacle detail. Why is it stuck here? Because God gave it to him while he was up there. He left Joshua part way down the mountain. Further down the mountain, he left the elders of Israel. But Moses by himself went up to be with God. Joshua was not very far away, but he wasn't where Moses was. Moses was alone with God. And then it says that as God is giving him all this direction and helping him to understand all the way through, he comes to the conclusion that he starts to hear something. I think it's interesting and informative that all of the sudden you get to the middle of chapter 31 and you pick up the story. Unfortunately, down below, the people wanted a pattern of worship. They wanted a place to worship. God knew that. Up in the top of the mountain, he was giving the plans for a place to worship. But at the bottom, people were 
were trigger happy. They couldn't wait for the plans of God, so they decided that they would create their own. The first half of chapter 31 tells you about these craftsmen that God had called, and, and the second half of chapter 31 tells you how God had given them a special sign of the Sabbath, and by the time you get to chapter 32, it says when the people saw that Moses wasn't coming down off the mountain, they assembled around Aaron and said, come, make us a God who will go for us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. He hasn't called, he hasn't written, he hasn't emailed, we got nothing, no posts on his Facebook page, and we have now decided that he's dead. And if he's not dead, he's not relevant because he's not here. And what they wanted was what God was giving them up there. The plans that God was unfurling, that's exactly what they hungered for. Give us something to worship. God was up there doing it. Now what's interesting is Aaron does his stupid, you know, I don't know what happened. We threw our gold earrings in the fire. And remember the gold earrings come from their slavery. Uh, and out pops this calf. And what's interesting is Moses and God are speaking. Look at verse 11 of chapter 32. Moses entreated the Lord as God, saying, O oh Lord, why does your anger burn against the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? Don't, don't kill them. The Egyptians are going to say, well, they were wrong for leaving. Moses comes down off the mountain. And when he comes down, he's carrying with him the tablets in his hand. Verse 19 says that as he came near the camp, he saw the calf and he saw the dancing. That word dancing isn't what you think. It's a seductive thing. And Moses' anger burned and he threw the tablets from his hand and he shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made, ground it to powder, made them drink it. Put it in water and made them drink it. I'd say he was a little ticked. And here's the point. Chapter 32 then, he says, gird on your loins, Levites. Go out and get everybody that's involved in this lascivious behavior that's going on out there. And that day, 3,000 people fell. A lot of people had to be butchered by people who knew them and grew up with them. This was going to scar and mark Israel for all their days. And God made them do it because God needed to recompense what they had done and balance the situation back in the children of Israel. They needed to take sin seriously. They needed the graphic picture of 3,000 graves in a graveyard to know, don't mess with me, I'm not kidding. What's interesting is that the end of chapter 33 gives you another covenant promise. They promise again. They, they promise again that they'll follow. And what I find interesting is that Moses has, in the middle of chapter 33, gone up and had a conversation with God. And God says, you know, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send somebody else. And he's like, if you're not going, I'm not going either. I can't deal with this people without you. The only hope I have is if you go with me too. God replaces the tablets in chapter 34 and then begins to spool out all of the details of the tabernacle. And for the rest of the book, I want you to go all the way to the end of the book. For the rest of the book, he gives a series of details. I'm asking you to go to chapter 40, to the last page in the book, because I want you to see how it ends. This is the point that I wanted to bring you to, and I don't want you to leave until you understand this one fact or truth that is behind the book. Look at verse 34 of chapter 40. Listen to the words. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When they finished building all that they were told to build, God showed up and a cloud came so heavy, the palpable presence of the majestic God was right there in the tabernacle so that Moses couldn't even walk inside the tent. You couldn't walk in there. It was, it was dark and heavy and it was filled with the Lord's presence. And it says, Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the outer tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of the house of Israel. Here's the end point. Look at the last words. It's not just that there was fire there. 
It's that if you go to the beginning of the book, the beginning of the book is a people that are in darkness and a Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph and they're crying out, where is God? Why is no one caring for us? And God meets a man. God meets Moses at a bush and the glory of the Lord begins in stages to be shown to Moses through things like a stick and a bush that, doesn't be, that isn't consumed. And, and you start the book with no glory and then there's some glory and then the people see the experiences but at the end they see full glory God is there this went from darkness to light from no glory to full glory from slavery to celebration from work to worship that's the story of the book and the story captures you because when Dr. Luke forms his writing in the book of Acts, he's telling the same story for a different group of people. You're going to see in the beginning that people are gathered together in fear. And then there's coming of power. And then there's people getting killed, Ananias and Sapphira, body bags. Don't mess with me, God says. And then there's rising up the ninth chapter of Acts, a five-foot-tall, bald guy by the name of Saul of Tarsus. And then the power of God will be seen and demonstrated in the church. And by the end of it, the book of Acts says, and they got to Rome, to the heart of the empire. From an obscure darkness, they carried the light right into the palace at the center of the Roman Empire. And what Luke didn't know was by 300 years later, it would be the empire. And Jesus Christ would be celebrated across the Roman world in what today is more than 20 countries from Scotland to Saudi Arabia. So the book of Acts tells the story in a way that the book of Exodus told the story before, from no glory to God's glory.